my name is Courtney O'Callaghan. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a third year MCN board member and a mentor in the MCN mentorship program. MCN is a nonprofit volunteer run professional organization committed to growing the digital capacity of museum professionals. MCN has developed a deep active community engaged in year round conversations, webinars and resource sharing. As an MCN member, you can join special interest groups, you can participate in our mentorship program, and you can shape MCN's future by holding a leadership role such as a SIG special interest group chair, and with time perhaps on the MCN board if you are interested. If you're not already a member, we hope you'll join us. You can learn more about any of this at mcn.edu and hopefully you know where that is because you're here and so you got tickets to the conference. I'd like to thank Microsoft, who is our Registration Assistance Fund sponsor, Axel, who is our Ignite sponsor, and all of the sponsors we have listed on the program schedule for helping us make this conference possible. Today's session is a Zoom meeting workshop. We are recording. It did say Chatham House rules, but that was wrong. So uh, just be aware. We're using the chat box for questions as you'll see in our chat from our MCN volunteer. Um, if you have a question, you can post your name and someone will call on you. And we would love it if you were willing to have your face and voice on the screen and make it more active. If you prefer not to verbally ask your question though, feel free to type it in the chat box and we'll still work to get to it. So we're three minutes in. Um, I'm guessing we're gonna wait another minute or two more, but I wanna make sure before we do that, that I turn this over to our fantastic and wonderful presenter, Andrew Lee. He's a Wikimedia strategist at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and someone that I met many years ago, helping me get our museum on Wikipedia. And I will forever be grateful for that, Andrew. Great, thanks so much, Courtney. Can you hear me okay? Is everything? Sounding all right? Excellent. So uh, I do have a tendency to talk fast at times when I'm excited and I'm very excited about the topic. So feel free to either in the chat or to signal the moderators to slow it down or repeat something. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, we're really lucky that we have two hours today. We're gonna try to mix it up to have a lot of different types of activities because there's nothing worse in the Zoom COVID era than sitting at your spot for two hours trying to learn something without doing anything. So uh, the first thing I'd love for you folks to do is to make sure you see my screen and it should say um, with a half red background, the joys of connecting your collections to Wikidata. And there are three links that we have there. Uh, the Probably the most important thing is the main one, bit.ly slash MCN 2020 Wikidata. And that'll get you a link to this exact slide deck. Uh, so I'm one of those folks who likes sharing the full slide deck with anyone because we're covering so many things and a lot of this might be new, you should have the opportunity to kind of, you know, to screen snapshot or to go back and look at anything that you want. But right now I'd appreciate you folks if you could um, go to the survey. So if you go to bit.ly slash MCN 2020 Wikidata survey, that should get you to this form and you don't have to enter your name or email or anything. I just want to get a basic idea of what you folks know, so we can cater the session better to what you folks have knowledge of. So thank you, Coven and other folks. Great to see you in the chat. Um, it's been a year, I wish we were there in person, wish we were doing Ignite in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. So if you folks could go to that survey and fill out just basically three things. One is what is your familiarity with Wikipedia in general? Uh, what is your familiarity with Wikidata? And it's perfectly fine to put none. I never heard of it until the, the workshop was described. Uh, and number three, just how would you rate your familiarity with using databases in general? Okay, again, we don't require any of this experience, but it helps as I uh, go through some of this to see basically where we need to recalibrate some of our content. Um, and then the last one is check as many boxes that are relevant to the title or your role in the organization. And this is especially tough. So sorry if your uh, role is not in this list, but just something in the right ballpark would be good here. And I'm seeing the responses come in already and I'm not gonna bring up the numericals uh, for you quite yet. I might show them later on in the, uh, in the session, but it's 
pretty good that we have about right in the middle, about 50% of the folks know something at Wikipedia, some 50% don't. Uh, this is really nice to know that familiarity with Wikidata we're seeing, uh, you know, most people are on the I don't know much about it scale. So that's great to see that we can, uh, we will not be boring you. We'll be telling you a lot of new things about Wikidata, but a lot of folks who already know something that Wikidata should learn something new as well. A lot of things have happened in the last year. And then in terms of familiarity with databases, we're seeing quite a number of folks do. More than 50% have a familiarity with databases, uh, which is good, but we don't require any expertise in databases at all. And then when we come to titles, museum staff, uh, the titles that I keep seeing here are manager, developer, technologist, uh, arts and culture consultant. So it's a good spread of folks. So thank you very much for doing that survey. It really does help to get a sense of where things are with the audience that we have. Okay, so here are the links again. And then we will be using a working doc later on. Well, we're gonna be asking you to try some things out and we'd love to see some of your results. So the easiest way to do this is with a Google doc and you can paste in screenshots if you'd like uh, in there. Uh, so again, these are the three links that we have, the slide deck, the survey, and the Google doc that everyone can write into later on. Okay. Does that sound okay, Courtney? Is everything sounding logical so far? Everything sounds fantastic. Excellent. So let me quickly introduce myself. This is my third MCN. And even when I was there for the first time, I felt right at home working with all the folks at MCN who were you know, pretty much in, in the same ballpark as what I was doing, which is working more with museums on how to uh, work with Wikipedia content and how to work with digital collections. So as Courtney said, I right now am working with the Met as a Wikimedia strategist to uh, work with their content. We also have uh, Jeannie Choi on the uh, call today, who will bring in, talk a little bit about what we've been doing there. And I think that'll be really interesting uh, for you folks to hear about. Uh, this is kind of a new thing that the Smithsonian Institution uh, with the launch of their strategic plan um, is bringing in, are bringing in more folks to work with their uh, goals towards a billion digital viewers of their content or users of their content. So I will be working with them as well as a Wikimedian at large, which is a very odd title, I know, but uh, we'll try to explain what that means later on. Uh, I've written a book about Wikipedia called The Wikipedia Revolution. So if you want to know more about the history of Wikipedia mm -hmm. and how it came about, um, there's a whole narrative about that. And there's also a book called Leveraging Wikipedia by the American Libraries Association. So for folks who work in that area, that might be an interesting compendium of stories on how different GLAM organizations have been working with Wikipedia over the years. So just to give you an overview, it's a, it's a nice long two hour period that we have. Um, so we're going to be uh, covering these three things. And COVID, no, I'm not at a cool bar. This is my set that in the COVID era, uh, more and more, you know, if I'm gonna be stuck at home, might as well make it look good. So there's my background there and I can change the colors as people want. Uh, so we're gonna cover what is Wikidata? What are the benefits of it? And uh, we're gonna be covering also how organizations can work with Wikidata and Wikimedia content. So folks might be familiar with Wikipedia, might even be familiar with Wikimedia Commons as a multimedia repository, but you're probably fairly new to Wikidata as a metadata storage area. And then C is like, what are some practical next steps you can take as an organization to work with Wikidata or the community? Uh, this will include some case studies and some recommendations on what to do and the, as, the, as a, basic fallback, you can always just contact me. And we have a big network of folks in the Wikimedia community that work with museums and institutions. So feel free to just contact me directly, but I'll also give you the uh, address of a new employee with the Wikimedia Foundation who's dedicated to GLAM activities. So some of you might know Fiona Romeo. She used to be with the uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art, I think in New York City, and has been in the UK for a while now. So just a very quick summary of the history of libraries, archives, and museums with the Wikipedia community. It kind of had a breakout year in 2010 when the British Museum hosted their first Wikipedia in residence. Andrew, and over I'm the going to interrupt you for a second. Yes. We are still seeing the first slide and I'm noticing oh. that. So we couldn't see your book and I don't know if what you're talking about now has a slide. So we'd love to see it. Oh, I don't know why you're not seeing it. Okay, let me see if I can reshare the screen and see that. Okay, let me reshare. All right, share my screen.
Okay. Are you seeing, let me see, let me try to move the slides here. Are you seeing my books right now? Or my yeah. Book? Okay. Excellent. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, and hopefully you see ABC on the screen right now. So those are the three things we're going to be doing. Excellent. And so this is the timeline of where we are now, I think. Uh, we had in 2013, kind of the breakout year in the United States, at least, for uh, the US National Archives having a full-time Wikimedian in residence. And ever since 2017, when a lot of organizations have started their open access initiatives, we now have the Met, Cleveland Museum, and now Smithsonian as of um, earlier this year or last year doing their open access uh, initiative. So this has been a, a big uh, two or three years in the life of LAMS and uh, Wikipedia. So for example, the open access uh, that we had the Met started in 2017. The Smithsonian has a goal. One of its third strategic goal is to reach a billion people a year with the digital first strategy. So I think it's uh, astute of these folks to say, I don't think a billion people are gonna visit our website our museum website on its own. We need to find the right places to have impact and for exposure. And that's where most folks look to the Wikipedia and Wikimedia community when they have these types of uh, lar large scale goals. So if I were to describe Wikidata briefly and why it's crucial to the 1 billion eyeballs for something like the Smithsonian digital strategy, it's the evolution of free knowledge, which we currently kind of see as Wikipedia, towards a multilingual linked open database. So if I were to describe Wikidata in one sentence, this would kind of be what it is. The evolution of free knowledge widely towards a multilingual linked open database and not, not using any technical terms like semantic or, or uh, structured at this point. But here's a very basic explanation for what Wikidata is, right? It doesn't help to talk about Wikidata without some basic introduction to it. So, this is just an example of a sentence that you might read in Wikipedia in what we call a lexical form, right? It's a sentence that we would read in English. The United States Congress is a bicameral legislature of the federal government of the United States. And the Wikidata version of this, or the way that we would express this in Wikidata is through structured statements, right? So we would basically store three pieces of info. United States Congress is an instance of a bicameral legislature. Okay, and then the second thing we might add is like United States Congress is in the country of the United States. So we basically take anything that we read in Wikipedia and we try to break it down into these three part statements that we store in Wikidata. That's the that's like 90% of what Wikidata is, is just taking facts and storing them as these three part statements in a database and wonderful things can happen once you store knowledge in this format. Right. So this is basically the, the semantic web in like 10 seconds. Right. So what do we do? How does this actually, uh, how do we actually do this in practical terms? Well, what happens is instead of article names or people or places, each of these entities or concepts has what we call a Q number in Wikidata. So Q numbers are unique identifiers for items in Wikidata. And to be human usable instead of Q1234, we should have some kind of label or description for what this Q number is. But the nice thing is that this Q number is unique and then we can put all different kinds of language labels on top of it or language descriptions on top of that, right? And we'll show you some examples later on why this is so important. So here's an example of what a Wikidata item looks like for the United States Congress. So you can see that it has a English language label of United States Congress and it has a very brief description called legislature of the United States and then what you might have seen on Wikipedia, for example, are redirects or aliases or links. You know, Some people might call it US Congress or American Congress or legislature of the United States. How do we keep this all straight? Well, the nice thing is that there's only one Q number for the concept of Congress and we can have multiple aliases or different labels. Because when someone says American Congress or Congress of the United States, they're still talking about United States Congress. So that's why we have all these aliases where it says also known as, right? So that's where we can have multiple names for this thing in Wikidata. Okay, so the Q number is the unique identifier and then the label description and aliases are the main information that we have about that concept or entity. Then these are the things that we just talked about before. We have things like Congress is an instance of a bicameral legislature. It's part of the federal government of the United States. The country that we're talking about is United States of America because you could have Congresses of other countries here, right? So this is where the three part statements come into play for Wikidata and you can start to see why this is called structured data, right? It's very rigid because we break down what we know into these three part statements. So 
what are we looking at in terms of these statements? We'd like to find out what is it? Is it a human? Is it a mammal? Is it a dog? These types of things. Uh, we might want to know the location of something that's a Q item. We might want to know if there's an ISBN number associated with a book, if a book is a Q item. We might want to know the ULAN ID if you're an artist, you know, what the ID is in another database. So these are all just parts of what make up statements in Wikidata. We walk away today with nothing else. Uh, you should have a link to this page. This is kind of a one page summary of Wikidata, pretty much what we're going to be talking about today, trying to be boiled down in one page with links out to the relevant parts of Wikidata. So if you uh, go to Wikidata one page, this is a, a guide that I put together and it's available in 10 languages now. Other people have translated this. So it's a nice 10,000 foot summary of what Wikidata is and what you should be paying attention to. So feel free to have this next to you as we talk about a lot of these things today. Okay, so hands on, let's start with looking at what Wikidata is about. So um, one of the things that I also point you to is this Wikidata doc. So if you can click on that link in the slides, you'll get there, or you can just type into your URL uh, bar bit.ly slash MCN 2020 Wikidata doc. All right, so if you go to that doc, hopefully you should see something like this. All right, so I'm going to wait for a number of icons to pop up there, meaning that folks are actually visiting the stock. So the top of the doc is trying to recap what I just talked about. Here's the, here are the links to all the major things I'm talking about. And then I took a very quick look at who was attending the session. I tried to digest the, the organizations that I saw there. See, so some of you might have more and feel free to add yourself to the list. If you have other rows there, just put your name there, or I'm sorry, not your name, but your organization name there. Because what we're going to do is we're going to have you look up the Q numbers for your different institutions and start to kind of break down what they are and what we could do to improve them. So yeah, go ahead and add more links or more uh, rows to that table. And if someone took up the last row, go ahead and you know, right click on that table and add more rows if you want. This is great. We're seeing your Historical Society, Mohonk Preserve, Isabella Stewart Garden Museum, awesome. New Museum. Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Wikidata. So let's go ahead and go to wikidata.org. Hopefully you're seeing this on the screen. And if ever I'm doing something, Courtney, and you don't see what's going on, then feel free to just ping me and or jump in. But this is the front page of Wikidata right here. And if you go up here, we're going to go ahead and try one of those entries out. So let's say I'm going up here and I'm going to say um, Smithsonian American Art Museum, right? OK, so notice as I type, it's matching against what is known in Wikidata. And I'm going to go ahead and click on Smithsonian American Art Museum. Okay, so if you do find your entity, your organization there, go ahead and look at your Q number right there and go ahead and paste it into the table. And don't worry if yours does not exist. That's actually really more interesting uh, than uh, if you found it. Yeah, so go ahead and go ahead and paste it in there. Yep, there's a, by default, Google pastes all the style in there. If you don't know this quick shortcut, if you're using a Mac, you can hit Shift Command V and it'll paste it without the style, which is kind of nice. So shift command V will paste it without the fancy fonts or the coloring and all that stuff. Great, so we're seeing people fill in those Q numbers. And don't worry if you don't have it. If you don't have one, you can say missing, sad face, or whatever you want there. But go ahead and I know for, for a fact that Longyear and Picker do not have Wikidata entries. Okay, good. So we're seeing people fill in those Wikidata entries there or the Wikidata Q numbers there. And if you, have a Q number for your organization, go ahead and inspect some things related to your entry, right? So the first thing I would do is make sure that the name is the right common name for your museum. And the description is an accurate description. And normally it'll be X museum in location. That's a pretty good basic description. If it's not, you might wanna go in and edit it right away. So what you might wanna do is go to the edit button right here if there's a little pencil right next. So if you edit, you'll notice that these fields are now editable and you can actually edit them like that. 
I'm not going to change it right now, but go ahead and edit right there. Or you can add more aliases, right? So I'm going to put in Sam with no dots. You notice that someone put in Sam s.a.a.m. And commonly within the Smithsonian, we'll just say Sam with no dots. So in case someone types that into the field, I'd like to match it against Sam with no dots. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And hopefully that will take and be committed to Wikidata. Uh, publish. Oh, maybe. Oh, sorry. Someone added that already. Okay, good. So whatever you want to add there, go ahead and hit publish right up here after you're done. And that'll be added to the entry. Right. So I noticed a number of organizations had um, a good label, but they didn't have a lot of aliases. So for example, um, some of them you have the in the front as the formal title, but don't have it in as an alias. So you might want to add that as well. So go ahead and try adding them and then go ahead and type into the third column any changes or aliases you might have added so that we just get a sense for what you are putting in there. Now, some of these, which are very high traffic, may not allow you to edit them. So something I did not make you do because I want to show you that Wikipedia and Wikidata don't require you to actually create an account. So you probably noticed, you're like, wait a minute, I didn't have to create an account. We recommend that you do, but one of the weird quirks and uh, amazing things about Wikipedia and its community is that by default, anyone can edit any page. Um, but a lot of the high traffic pages will be kind of locked down and you need to create an account for things like Smithsonian or for the Met Museum or um, Yale Center for British Art. But for the ones that are not as high traffic, they want to encourage new folks to edit them. So feel free. Yes, the uh, Getty one is probably going to be locked. So if you have a Wikipedia, um, if you have a Wikipedia account, you have a Wikidata account as part of that. So you can actually log in and edit that if your account is more than seven days old, something like that. Okay, so if it's locked, go ahead and enter an alias that you would want, and I can make that change for you, or you can log in and make an account there. So we can see the Nelson Atkins Museum. Looks like someone's adding a lot of good aliases there. That's great. And this is just to increase the discoverability of your organization, right? We like to have the Q number to be well known, the title to be the common name, but we highly recommend folks enter in as many aliases that make sense for your organization that are likely to be added or to be looked up in there uh, in Wikidata. So it's great to see different folks adding those aliases in there. Good. So already you're increasing the um, exposure of your organization simply by adding more aliases. And we'll tell you later on about the um, function of matching content outside of Wikidata to stuff that's inside Wikidata and providing more of these aliases, you provide more uh, higher percentage uh, of a chance for a match for these types of things. Okay, great. So we are seeing you change those aliases. That's great. That's the most basic thing. So you'll notice that when you change an alias, it has an edit button at the top, but then every other function that you want to do to edit is pretty much in context for where you want to make that change. So for example, here at instance of art museum, if you want to change that, you would hit the edit button right there next to that right there. Okay. Um, and I don't think this is a item right now. No, it's not. But if I want to say here, um, Uh, so if you see, if I want to add more things here, it will not let me free text enter things, which is very, quite interesting. It has to match against other items in Wikidata. So you're starting to see the structured part of Wikidata uh, take hold here. If anyone's ever edited Wikipedia, you'll know that you can type whatever you want, hit the save button, um, typos and all. But here you can see you're kind of editing on Rails. You have to enter something here that is already in Wikidata. And if it's not in Wikidata, you need to create it in Wikidata first before you add it to something like this. So that's why Wikidata is quite different than Wikipedia. It's much more rigid and it's much more quality check because you need to have all these uh, nouns and verbs fixed on Wikidata first before you make those changes. So are there any questions right now? If, you, um, if anyone has any questions right now regarding what we just talked about, the Q number for Wikidata, the labels, the description, the aliases, which are really good to add any common aliases people might know your organization by, and then the statements that you can edit one by one below. Okay, and you can see that some things are special like images, they'll show the image. Um, if it's coordinates, it will show a map right there. And we'll, we'll show you some examples of that later on. So you can see that Wikidata tries to be more multimedia by default. If you enter in data that can be 
you know, map to geo coordinates or can pull images from Wikimedia Commons. Something that is very, uh, very common for folks to ask about is, oh, can I put any image in here? Unfortunately, the only images you can put in here are ones that are legitimate in Wikimedia Commons under a free license. So that is quite a restriction that we have is that the images need to be free and uploaded to Wikimedia Commons. You can't just point to a random Google image search image or one at an institution. It has to be free on Wikimedia Commons. Okay, any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat right there or to raise your hand and Courtney can bring you in for anything that's there. Okay, so that's your basic kind of hands-on. Let's see what else, other things people have done. Um, I think, yes, the Minneapolis Music Institute of Art. Anyone who's been to the Ohio State University knows that this is a big deal for some organizations. Uh, J. Paul Getty Museum, JPGM. Let's go ahead and change that. So let's go ahead and J. Paul. So we're gonna go to J. Paul Getty Museum. Okay, and we have do have some good aliases there. And we're gonna go ahead and hit the edit button and we're gonna go ahead and type in JPGM. And then we have the Getty in lowercase, let's just say the Getty with a capital, oops, sorry, in case matters. So we're gonna hit return there and it's gonna publish that to Wikidata. And just like Wikipedia, if you've ever looked at the history, you can go ahead and click on view history and you will see all the changes that have been made to this entry including my entry that I just made right there. It's a change in English aliases and it automatically adds that edit summary there. Um, okay, so my screen is tiny. So I'm gonna put on my glasses to read these questions. With the gallery that I'm a docent, our entry doesn't show links to popular artists. Would you improve search results? How did you go about this later? Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of how artists relate to uh, institution entries on Wikidata. Well, that's an interesting question. How do, how do you link you know, your most significant holdings to your Wikidata entry. And uh, there are statements that you can add to Wikidata for that. All right, great. So that is our first exercise is just to get familiar with the interface of Wikidata. And thank you for adding it. You've already enriched Wikidata with these aliases that you folks are experts at. All right, so that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, one thing that is really useful for these aliases these are the most common reasons why we have aliases. Number one is language variation. So one of the uh, folks I saw who registered was part of this, uh, I think Swedish museum. Um, so sometimes you will put the name of your museum in the English translation, but you might also wanna be findable by your authentic name, whether it's Spanish or Swedish or French or anything else. So sometimes that's a great reason to have not only the common name of your museum, or institution in English, but also the Swedish version or the French version as well. Even though it's not technically English, that's good. Also something that's useful is to have the diacritical variation. Sometimes Jose without the accent and sometimes with the accent or both. Um, and then leading the, we just had an example with the Minneapolis. And then formal titles versus colloquial, right? So you might have multiple things. Uh, and this is a little joke in our Wikipedia world. We're still not sure what to do with new fields. Like is new fields the, the official name or is, Indianapolis Museum of Art, a sub part of Newfields, and it's not clear from the Newfields site. So if anyone here from Newfields or knows those folks, we could talk and figure out how to model Newfields correctly in Wikidata. All right, so Wikidata items. Let's dive deeper in. Using identifiers removes language dependency, right? So the nice thing is that you have one Q number and you have lots of different things you can layer on top of it. For, so for example, this is probably the best example you can think of is Mormar Gaddafi. Anyone's ever seen how his name is spelled in, in the press? Notice that there's like 50 some variations of this depending on how you uh, phoneticize Arabic language text, right? So here's a great example. We have over 50 Latinized variations of Muammar Gaddafi, but only one Q number for him as the person, right? So that's a great example of why we have these aliases to find the person through multiple labels and aliases. And then this, this uh, this task of matching what we have in Wikidata with what you have in your institutional database is a process called reconciliation. All right, so you might hear this term quite a bit, not only in the Wikidata context, but I have this list of artists at our organization. How do I know they're in Wikidata? And this process is called reconciliation. And the most common tool for this is called open refine. We're not gonna go into it here, but you should look it up. And it, it's, a, it's like the industry standard for how you match databases or try to align and to compare different databases. Uh, so you should know about that tool. So 2017 was a real turning point in using Wikidata. 
It was uh, pretty much the year where we started to see the emergence of digital assistants like Siri and Alexa. We already knew that Google uses Wikipedia and Wikidata extensively, but now we know that Apple does, we, Microsoft does, DuckDuckGo, all these different major dot coms are using it for searching and uh, machine learning even. Wikidata edits have risen pretty much every year consistently over time. So you can see that the project started in 2012, but it's now accounts for the most edits of any project in the Wikimedia universe. So even more than Wikipedia because it's a multilingual project. So here's just a great uh, illustration for how many items in Wikidata had uh, content with a geo coordinate. And this is what it lit up as. And it probably is no surprise that Wikidata started as a German project. So Europe has a lot of, uh, has a lot of lit up sites there. And even North America doesn't really compare to Europe back in 2015. But I'm going to step through year by year, 2015, 2016. You can see this little flashpoint in Africa. Someone really went to town on Rwanda, I think it was down there. And then you can start to see between 2016, 2017, you can start to see the Middle East, Asia, South America start to really get involved with Wikidata. And then 2018, you can start to see it really emerged as a lot more content start to come into Wikidata. So that's just a great example of how, you know, 2017 was a pivotal year, 2018 is really where it started to get a lot more exposure. So what are some examples of why this matters? So here's an example that we had at the Smithsonian where we created an article as part of what we call an edit-a-thon for Ada Lovelace Day. So at the National Air and Space Museum, uh, we created an article for a balloonist and inventor named Vera Simons. She had no Wikipedia content no Wikidata content. And if you Googled her, you'd come up with like Air and Space Museum and some other smattering of links. Within 15 minutes of creating her Wikidata item and her Wikipedia article and uploading an image of her from the National Air and Space Museum, it showed up in Google as number three. And by the end of the day, if you went on your iPhone or iPad and you didn't even fire up a web browser, you just typed into the search box, you typed in Vera Simons, you will get what you see on the right-hand side of the screen there. You will see her Wikipedia content and Wikidata content, saying that she's inventor, balloonist, artist, her name, her picture, and the lead sentence from Wikipedia. Now that's pretty astonishing. You couldn't even buy that if you wanted to from Google to say, hey, I want to be in search, search result number three. Uh, no, you can't. Um, you could buy an ad to try to be number one, but to just organically be number three, there's only one site in the world that does that, and that's Wikipedia and Wikidata. We also did an ex experiment at the, um, the Met where we created an article and Wikidata content for this sculpture uh, for Why Born Enslaved. And the exact same thing happened. DuckDuckGo, Google, Bing, uh, Yahoo Search, it all showed up you know, in the first hour of creating this. And it's now available on voice assistants and Siri. And it just shows you the importance of this. So if you're trying to convince higher management or upper management why this matters, point to these two examples. We got many other examples of how impact within an hour of creating this content um, makes a huge difference. Something that might be on your museum website for years suddenly gets a lot more exposure once it is in the Wikipedia and Wikidata ecosystem. Yeah. So here's another great example of the growth that we saw at the Met over the years. There now have been 700 million or more page views to Wikipedia articles with Met images since the open access initiative started. Um, average traffic to Met images on Wikimedia projects has gone up five to six times over that period. And then we have these really weird anomalies, which are good anomalies, where we have this gigantic spike of content uh, views. And this just happened to be the month where this photograph from Juliet Margaret Cameron was on the front page of French Wikipedia and the Notre Dame Cathedral Fire, if you remember that, used pictures from the Met's uh, collection. So that caused a gigantic spike. Uh, in uh, May of 2019. But what's really interesting, if you look at the right-hand side of this graph, is even with the pandemic that started, what, J January, February of this past year, you can start to see that the traffic has still gone up monotonically as in the past. And this was a, a big, uh, a big uh, thing to see for museums that were really suffering, like how are people gonna visit our co content and collections? They were still impacted by the Met content, even though Met was closed for most of those months there. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, why Wikidata and the design of Wikidata and some examples of how we use it for uh, institutional collections, right? So right now, you know that there are more than 6 million English language articles in uh, Wikipedia 
It's one of the five most visited websites on the entire planet. And it's gotten so popular and so useful to the point where in the last two years, in this world of you know fake news or fake, fake news, and we're not even sure where the news is, we're starting to see multi-billion dollar corporations relying on Wikipedia. Facebook, YouTube, all these folks are pointing to Wikipedia to try to sift fact from fiction. This was an announcement in 2018. YouTube will link directly to Wikipedia articles to fight conspiracy theories. Uh, this is where they're directing people to go to try to get the truth about things. Um, and then we're also seeing different organizations like the Tate uh, linking to artist bios on Wikipedia saying, you know, we don't have the staff to do all this. In fact, the, the content of Wikipedia is better than we could do for most of these folks. Um, Museum of Modern Art now actually not only uses Wikipedia content for their artist bios, they link to the Wikidata items specifically on their pages, right? So we're starting to see not Wikidata, not just a behind the scenes uh, metadata uh, project, but actually being publicly exposed in this way is quite interesting. So it's fascinating to think in just this last 20 years, that Wikipedia is coming on the 20th anniversary in January, that it's gone from wiki, fast, loose, weird, unreliable, should we trust it, to wiki, please save us from fake news. Please uh, read it to get more information about artists and history. That's pretty amazing to think about that in the last 20 years. All right, so we have Wikipedia challenges though. So as much as Wikipedia has been successful, we also know that knowledge is now scattered among the 30 million articles in 200 languages. We, we often look at Wikipedia in English and say, oh, it's got the 6 million articles, it's the biggest, it's a superset of everything that's out there. Absolutely not. Wikipedia English is great, but it's got a lot of holes. It's missing lots of biographies of women, it's missing lots of biographies of folks outside the United States, and missing a lot of information about uh, historical sites. So we know there's inconsistency and gaps in this content purely in the Wikipedia editions. So how do we consolidate these knowable facts? And you probably guessed Wikidata is the answer to this, right? So this is my basic explanation for why Wikidata fits into this, this uh, mix quite well. Wikipedia is kind of at the top of the pyramid here, right? Wikipedia consists of text articles and we actually have a very high bar for notability. You have to be pretty well known. You need to be covered by New York Times, USA Today, have a book reviewed in a major publication before you qualify for a Wikipedia article. So we have a lot of stuff that we leave out of Wikipedia intentionally because we rely on reliable sources. So a lot of women scientists, Nobel Prize winning women scientists, we don't have in Wikipedia because they haven't been covered. There's systemic bias in the reliable sources out there. So they're missing from Wikipedia. Um, and there are inconsistencies across editions and they're stale and they're inaccurate at times. So we learned something in 2001 when we start to see images scattered out in Wikipedia editions. Say, hey, it's kind of silly to have uh, Marie Curie's picture in French Wikipedia and in English Wikipedia and they're two different copies. So why can't we consolidate the copies of images so we only have one place? And that's what Wikimedia Commons was, a place to centralize and consolidate multimedia. So that's what we have as Wikimedia Commons. Right? So Wikimedia Commons is the multimedia repository. And notability is very low. You could go out and take a picture with your iPhone, upload to Commons, as long as it's not spam, um, it would be welcome there. So it's a very low bar for notability in uh, Wikimedia Commons. Um, it has, unfortunately, very weak metadata functions, though. You can't really say, show me all pictures of birds that are green. It doesn't really do that right now. Um, in fact, almost all the metadata is English language based, which is terrible. So we're missing out on the uh, on reaching folks who don't understand English. And it lacks complex search operations, as we said. But we do have this gigantic repository in Wikimedia Commons. So the challenge we have for Wikipedia is what if we could convert all that text content we have in Wikipedia into structured statements and turn that into a machine readable and machine understandable? This is often called, let's store things and not strings, right? Let's store concepts and entities and not specific uh, names for Muammar Gaddafi. So that's what Wikidata is, right? So Wikidata has a much lower bar for no notability. We can import every single woman PhD who's written a research paper that's been cited. Perfectly fine in Wikidata. That's great. Um, it is language independent. So as we saw before, we could have Muammar Gaddafi in all these different languages and different spellings. And the great thing about this is we can explicitly store external identifiers. We can point to library catalogs. We can point to the Met page, the Museum of Modern Art page. We can link to the American Museum of Natural History page for these scientists and things like that. So we can start to link to other databases in ways you cannot really do with Wikipedia. And we can do complex queries. We can say, show me all women mayors of cities larger than 100,000 people. 
And that's actually a query that we have in Wikidata on a regular basis. We can just kind of see uh, all this information very quickly with a query. So that's why we want Wikidata as this kind of layer where we can store a lot more things that we have now than what's in Wikipedia and start to consolidate facts and information. So sometimes this is referred to as you know, linked open data for libraries, archives, museums, or, or LoadLAM, right? You might've heard that uh, acronym before. Or Wikidata linking to stable external data of GLAM institutions and why Wikidata can be kind of this database of databases. It can be this place where you're pointing to all the different um, places on the web to do this. Okay, so here's an example of how we might take content from a Wikipedia article and break them down into Wikidata content. We took a very simple example before, but look at all the other stuff that we find on a Wikipedia article. We find coordinates, geo-coordinates. We find out that it's um, bicameral. We find that it meets the capital. And then the bottom of a lot of Wikipedia articles, we see things like this. This is what we call the navigation box in a Wikipedia article, but there's tons of useful metadata here that we're actually not using at all. It's here for display, but it's not being used for logic or for anything else. So what if we could mine all this content that we find at the bottom of artists, uh, archeological sites, heritage sites, and take this and put it in a structured database. And that's what Wikidata is doing. So we can see that there are different caucuses for Congress. There are different committees. Uh, what if we can model this in Wikidata to, to, to show all the relationships here, not just as text, but as, as uh, links in the database. Okay, so Wikidata was launched in 2012 to try to capture all this content. And it provides not just the power of reading this stuff, but to search and sort and to uh, investigate this data. So the claims that we just talked about before, the statements where Congress is a bicameral legislature, right, is what we call a statement in Wikidata. Sometimes it's called a claim, but it pretty much just is made up of item, property, value, right? Washington DC, geocoordinates, then here are the numbers. Or it's just very basically something in Wikidata has a relationship to something else in Wikidata. Very simple, right? So the queue numbers are our kind of nouns or our things in this database, right? Anyone can create a queue item. You can go in right now to Wikidata, say create a new item, and hopefully it's notable enough to have something. But we encourage people to create queue numbers all the time. So from some examples of queue numbers, number one, Q1 is the universe, which just kind of makes sense, I guess. You probably want to make that as queue number one. Um, Earth is Q2, Q5 is human. Obviously, Wikidata uh, people are cat lovers because for some reason, cat is Q146. It comes before animal. Don't ask me why, but we love cats, I guess, in the Wikipedia community. Um, book is Q571. Library is 7075. Museum, shame, way down the list, 33,506. Uh, nothing we can do about it now. That's just the numbers that we have. But the numbers are not important. It's the labels that we use on top of that, right? We don't really deal with the numbers that much. Then we also have properties. So these are the relationships that we have, right? We have things like J. Paul Getty Museum is an instance of museum, right? Um, or Herrick House is an instance of histor historic house museum. Uh, so we actually have these properties and these are not created by anyone. These are very tightly controlled. We don't want people uh, willy nilly making properties. We wanna tightly control this vocabulary so that we are consistent, that they align with other vocabularies like Getty, um, or um, Europeana and things like that. Right? So these are things like, is it an instance of something? Is it uh, the date of birth, the court location, or is it an inventory number at your organization, like an accession number? So these are things we wanna control and these are the ones that are useful to museum professionals, right? So these are just kind of the list of properties and you can click on that in there. All right, I thought I could pause right now. If there's any questions from anyone, uh, that is just the, you know, 90% of Wikidata is just understanding Q numbers as the nouns and P numbers as the connections between those, those objects or nouns in Wikidata. And if you get that, you're pretty much, you know, understanding Wikidata. Okay, so feel free to type into the chat uh, if you have any questions around those things. So here is an example of what a Q item looks like for George Washington. You can start to see this makes sense. So just think of anything that you can break down. It's almost like sentence diagramming, right? You say, George Washington was, uh, you know, the founding father of the United States and, you know, he was painted in this painting. So you can start to see this is all broken down. Instance of human, part of the founding fathers, uh, sex or gender, male, country citizenship, United States of America, right? So once we have these three-part statements, sometimes we call these triples um, or uh, statements, claims, triples are all pretty much the same. You can start to see that we have the representation, the database of Q23, P31, Q5. That's what the database stores 
but for human readability, we have George Washington instance of human. All right, so that's for our convenience. The cool thing is we can translate those labels and go to all these other languages and suddenly see that German, Spanish, uh, Malaysian, Chinese, we don't have to create new Q numbers for all these things. We just put the different labels in those different languages. And the cool thing is if I model something in Wikidata using English, everyone else with those other languages get it for free. That's something that does not occur in Wikipedia right now. If I write an English article in Wikipedia, someone has to go through the labor of translating every single word to all under 200 languages. Here, if I just say Q23, P31, Q5 in Wikidata, every other language benefits from me putting that knowledge into Wikidata. So you can start to see this is very powerful now. It's not, I don't even have to know Chinese or Malaysian, uh, Bahasa, uh, Malayu or Spanish. I don't even have to know these languages exist. As long as someone has translated the labels, they get that information and that knowledge, which is really cool. So what you probably did not know is this is hiding in plain sight. So I don't know how many people have actually clicked on the Wikidata item link in a Wikipedia article. If you don't respond in the chat, I'm gonna assume you've never done it, but has anyone ever gone to that Wikidata item link in a Wikipedia article? I'd be surprised. All the time, good. Oh, well, Cal, you, you're, you, you know what you're doing. But uh, <laughs> there's all kinds of, no, yes, nope. Yeah, so most people don't know it exists, right? So let's say I'm over here and say SpaceX Crew 1. This is a main story here in Wikipedia. It is hiding in plain sight. In fact, anyone who's done like eye tracking studies, I think you've realized this is the least likely place anyone would ever click on, on a web page. So it's right here, hiding in plain sight. You click on Wikidata item. And I encourage you to do this, inspect the Wikidata items and help improve it, right? So you can see SpaceX Crew 1, commercial crew program mission. You might wanna say American or something like that um, to make that better, but you can start to see the statements that are here. Part of that, here's the logo image. Um, now, whether these are really NASA images that are public domain or not, we I probably need to check on those, but probably is if they've survived. So you can start to see all the information that people are adding here, crew members, UTC date of spacecraft launch. And these are all properties that other folks have, have sussed out as being the right properties to have for a space launch. Okay, so good to see you folks. Or some folks have done it, but don't worry if you've never done it. It's just really interesting to see how much does the article match with what you see in Wikidata? And if it doesn't match, please do add more stuff to Wikidata. It's still a very young project that needs more eyeballs and labor. All right, so Wikidata item will get you to something like this. And you will see there is the item. There is the property right there. And this is the value. And for most things, this value has to be something in Wikidata already, right? It has to be something that has been set up as a Q number. But then other things like coordinates or date or a accession number, those are not in Wikidata, right? Those are just free form uh, numerical fields. So they will be checked against things like, is it a number? Is it an integer? Is it a fraction? But you know, Wikidata tries to put you on rails as much as possible when you add this information. But you can see that underlying in Wikidata, we store Q11268, P31, Q189445. That's what's stored in the database. And then we have those labels on top to give it meaning to us um, that's readable. All right. So sometimes we call these triples. Sometimes we call it uh, statements or claims. But you can start to see that we can do all kinds of neat things here and that we can say a bicameral legislature in Wikipedia, I'm sorry, in Wikidata is an example of a voting, well, that's not exactly a voting system, but I guess it is. Um, voting system, it's part of a political system, part of a societal system. So you can actually do cool things like search Wikidata for all examples of legislatures that use a particular voting system because we have bicameral legislature modeled like this in Wikidata. Right. So let's just compare this to traditional databases. So this is why I uh, ask folks, how familiar are you with traditional databases? If you've ever used a spreadsheet or even an address book, you know what a traditional database is, right? Rows and columns. That's all it is, right? And then what we call that organization of how many columns should I have? And should it be a date? Should it be a country? Should it be a medium? That's what we call a schema, right? The organization of your database in these rows and columns is what we traditionally call a database schema. So things that you might have used before, um, anything from like MySQL or SQL or, um, wow, so any of the PC-based ones like uh, DBase, these are what we call relational databases, right? If you learn structured query language saying select this from that, that's what we call a relational database. These were the dominant databases for 
decades. And it's a good reason why. They're just organizing things in the rows and columns. The problem with these is that um, if you want to change the schema, it's very disruptive. You need to kind of get agreement from everyone who uses these databases that, you know what, I'm not going to call it medium anymore. I'm going to call it uh, material and I'm going to break it down to two different columns. Is that okay? And you need to get agreement from everyone that you're going to do this. Otherwise, chaos reigns. So anyone who's used TMS or any database uh, or um, asset management system at an organization, you know that you usually have one or two folks who really dominate the database because they need to know what's going on. And you can't just willy-nilly change columns and, and change something from an integer to a you know, some other kind of field. You need to kind of have someone who's a database administrator. Even that word administrator of a database is, is uh, very um, traditional. So the difference here is that relationships in this kind of traditional relational database is, is they're not easy to find. So here's the difference. Wikidata is now what we call a new generation of RDF databases. So sometimes, you know, there's different names for this kind of stuff. Sometimes you hear folks saying no SQL, like it's not structured like, um, a, a relational database. There's no rows and columns. And that's a good reason why. Most of those triples that we talked about, these statements, we didn't talk about rows and columns. We're pretty much saying, okay, Edward Hopper is a citizen of the United States and he was born in this state and he created this, but that's in this collection now and that's a painting. So you can start to see how we're starting to model relationships in kind of a free form way here. So you can see why this kind of database is often called a graph database or a triple store. Um, in a way that's very different than the rigid rows and columns databases of the past. And there's a role for each of these different types of databases, but for the Wikipedia community, this was a dream come true, right? Uh, Wikipedia is a project that's never done. It's kind of always in flux, always a work in progress. And for someone to have to lay down the law saying, we're gonna structure it this way with rows and columns would never have worked. But if you do it in this way of saying, I'm gonna add a statement here, a statement there, and I'm gonna change this today, and it might be different tomorrow, then this kind of triple store RDF database is ideal. It can always be changing. There's no fixed schema, um, but that's that can be challenging too. We're gonna to talk about that in a second. Like we, this is the same database where art historians are doing the, are working the same space as military history folks, doing the same thing as fashion history folks. It can get a little confusing at times. All right, so the summary, RDF triples or the triple store or the graph database, like we could add, it makes for very flexible and fast systems. They're suitable for the wiki culture of being bold and changing stuff. And the weird thing is multiple parallel ontologies can exist, right? How we model dresses and vases and historical houses all can be mixed in the same database. The downsides are it's hard to figure out how to find stuff. Honestly, it's kind of weird. Like if you want to go in there and say, show me all, uh, baseball cards, sometimes, like, is it an instance of a card? Is it an instance of a baseball card? Is it an instance of a card that's used for sports? How do you find that thing, right? So that's not easy. Um, it can be hard for newcomers to understand, right? These triples are kind of weird. And then the same reason why it's a benefit is also the same reason why it's a downside, <laughs> is that multiple parallel ontologies can exist. That means you sometimes don't need to fix the big problem. You can kind of just concentrate on a little problem of how do I model baseball cards? But then someone from Library of Congress can come by and say, well, I model baseball cards like this. And then you might be passing each other in the night. You might not be doing things the same way. Um, and there's nothing to enforce you ever doing things the same way in Wikidata. So that can be a, a big downside. All right, so let's take a quick pause here. Any questions before we try our hand at something hands on? So at this point, you should understand Wikidata is a triple store a graph database, an RDF database, they're all pretty much synonymous with this kind of new database system where we're storing statements in this way and they're easy to kind of manipulate with three-part statements. Okay, any questions, feel free to enter in the chat or you can raise them or raise your hand somehow in Zoom and Courtney can call on you. We'll start to get to specific examples now with how they work with uh, GLAM organizations. So if you want to take a little stretch break, feel free. We're, oh, we're going to almost an hour right now. So feel free to stretch before we start this exercise. I'm going to stretch. So we're going to be doing a project, uh, sorry, an example of using a Wikidata knowledge graph. And this is actually pretty new. So you folks are um, getting a, a sneak peek at some new tools that we created here. Um, for anyone who was at MCN last year, this is, a, this is what I talked about at the Ignite talk, but I didn't get into the nuts and bolts of how it works. So we're going to actually get into how it works. Okay, so the easiest thing to do is if you have a mobile phone, it's actually pretty cool. You can actually QR code scan that QR code. That's what I made you folks do in San Diego last year. But you can also just click on the w.wiki slash 55D and get to that. So let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. 
And the cool thing about this is this is not a canned multimedia example here. This is a live query on Wikidata that brought back all these different entities and you can actually drag them around the screen and see the relationships here, right? So you can start to see that this Death of Socrates is a painting. Death of Socrates here is also a painting. They both depict Socrates and depict the trial of Socrates here. Um, and then they also kind of show how different works are related here. Like there's another work by Raphael that depicts Socrates. And this is not exhaustive, obviously, but it's just showing you some examples here. All right, so make sure everyone can bring that up on your screen. So whether it's on mobile phone or whether it is by uh, bring it up on your web browser. I'm going to do it on mobile phone just to show you this is doable. So if you bring this up on your mobile phone, you should see on any modern phone, this come up on your Safari or Chrome browser, right? And feel free to drag them around, click on those items, and you'll see that Wikidata squirrels away and says, oh, oh, you want to know more information? Go ahead. Well, look, look at that. That's really cool. And you can say, oh, it's a Metropolitan Museum of Art. So the blue bubbles are showing you what it found. If you want it to stick around, go ahead and click on Salon of 1787, for example, and look, it's now part of your graph. So it hasn't changed Wikidata, it's just what you're displaying. So you're starting with Death of Socrates, go back and say, no, I'm interested in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. All right, so there it is. Uh, where's Metropolitan Museum of Art? I can click on that and it can say, uh, oh, it's actually here in Manhattan. I click on Manhattan and you can start to grow your display, which is really cool. Right, so this is live. So this is not a canned exercise. I mean, you're used to seeing a lot of cool animations and stuff that people spent time, you know, working in the Adobe After Effects or whatever. This is live and anyone can do these queries. We'll get into it later on, but I'll show you what the query looks like. This is the code that gets that query. Don't worry, I'll show you in a second how this all works. But this is just to prove to you that there's no fishy business going on here. This is actually just specifying the Q numbers you're interested in Wikidata, and it's going to show you all that stuff. And any organization can right now do this with things that are related to your collections or anything that you have in Wikidata and show those connections together. All right. So let's take a look at Trial Socrates and see that, oh, it's Socrates, instance of Jacques-Louis David. And we can start to see other information about them. So this is just another way of experiencing knowledge that I think is you know, I've been working on this for two, three years now. It still blows me away. Like, I wish I had a tool like this when I was a kid to see these connections, because otherwise we're leafing through paper encyclopedias and we never understand a lot of these things, right? So here's a question. Yes, so Liz. Yeah, we have a question yes. from Liz Neely. She wants to know, uh, can linked data include data external to Wikidata, such as Wikidata that links to the LOC, Library of Congress? Yes, that's a great question. Um, what Wikidata does now is it can hold a pointer to what is an LC's database. So this will often happen for like authority control records for people. So if you go to uh, Library of Congress and if we go to id.loc.gov, this is kind of their main portal for finding their linked open data records. So if you go in here and you say Barack Obama, uh, the thing to look at here, there's a lot of stuff that comes back, right? You author books, but what you want to do is say under name authority, you know, and you want to try to find out the main name authority for Barack Obama. And that's probably the number, which is identifier there. And what the, the philosophy of these databases is that Wikidata shouldn't try to hold everything about Barack Obama, right? Like it shouldn't try to replicate all the stuff that Library of Congress has. Hopefully all these organizations, whether it's Library of Congress, OCLC, the Met, Smithsonian, will all have their own Wikidata-like databases. And then we'll, we're gonna do something what they call federation, right? Means that you don't have to have everything in one database, but I can kind of say, look up this in the Met database and look up that in the LC's database and look up this in Smithsonian and show me the results. And that is possible today. It's not being used that much, but we actually have federation across 40 some different databases off Wikidata. So you can actually say, um, look up this identifier in LC's database and then that field in LC's database and bring them all together and display that in one record. So that is the 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 the, the dream to have all yeah, that. That's the dream. I, I guess I was <laughs> because yeah, I've gone into Wikidata records and linked it up to LOC and, and ULAN IDs and then have that make sure that's in my collection. So like the graph right. tool that you show us, if it could actually start like actually even breaking the 
the membrane, like um, that right. would be so cool because if this had, if this knows it's linked to that LOC record and that, that um, name file is also in linked data, if that could link out, because I think that's like, when I think about putting my collection in, if it's just another export that nothing ends up linking together, it's not the dream quite yet, right? And so I guess that's what I was um, talking about is if, 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 if this kind of, this tool is beautiful, and if this tool helped break that wall, it'd be awesome through those very, you know, through even those top level um, uh, crosswalks there, that would be really cool. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's possible today. We just have, I, I've never done it before, but it should be possible. Uh, but you, as you said, it requires that those organizations have a functioning RDF database that you can actually uh, do that federated query into. And uh, more and more folks are experimenting with it. And if you want to look at the software that Wikidata uses, it's called Wikibase. And it's something you can actually download and play with. And if you're familiar with Docker, that is the, the simplest way to play with it. There's a Docker container. You can download it and just launch it on your Mac, your PC, um, even like Amazon Cloud, and just kind of like one click, it'll, it'll start it up, and you have like a replica of the of the system of Wikidata with nothing in it, and you can start to populate it with artworks or whatever you want to try out. So uh, that's been more popular last year, but that's a great question. Like that's the dream of punching through to those federated databases and showing these really intricate connections. Yep. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's great. So I would highly encourage you to play with this. I'm going to show you a tool later on the, in the third hands-on where you can specify anything that you want and start exploring. Right now, that's one canned example, uh, but we can show you an example in a second. Uh, oh, Jay, we're going to show it to you right now. Good. So we're going to show you this tool that I hacked up this past year. It's called knowledgegrapher.toolforge.org. So you can click on that. And it's a very simple interface like this. Okay, so it's called Knowledge Grapher dot toolforge.org where you can click on that right there. I can probably put a link in our chat if that helps people because it's a long, it's not hard to type, but it's a long, weird name to type. And what we can do here is just type in any two starting entities. So I suggested you type in right flyer and right brothers, right? So the right flyer was their first plane and right brothers. So this is a very innocent looking text box, but the cool thing is, if you look at the examples here, I can type in any name of a Wikipedia article in French, English, Spanish, Chinese, whatever I want, um, or I can put in the, the raw Q number from Wikidata, but I'm just gonna put in these two, Right Flyer and Right Brothers as my two starting points. And if I hit graph, it should show a connection between them, right? It should say, oh, Right Brothers designed, or the Right Flyer was designed by the Right Brothers. What I can do is I can start clicking on these nodes and start building out my graph. So you can say, oh, it was followed by the right flyer two, which is kind of interesting. And the right flyer two is an instance of an aircraft. That's good to know. Um, I can go in here and start exploring. It's, oh, it's at the National Air and Space Museum. That's kind of neat. I can go ahead and hopefully click on that. So go ahead and try that. So for folks, go to knowledgegrapher.toolforge.org. And this is just a very simple tool that you can type in any two entities or three or four or five, whatever you want. And if there's a connection, it'll graph that connection between them. And then you can start to grow that graph in displaying that, right? Another one I suggest you folks could try is uh, Sue the Dinosaur at the Field Museum, which is kind of fun. So you can look up an artifact that's famous and hopefully we have a Wikidata item about it, I hope. But type in EN for English, dinosaur. That's our Wikipedia article name for it. And then Blue Field Museum. And this is where those, um, at least those help, right? Do I have to say the Field Museum or Field Museum? Well, hopefully this will match it. Let's hit graph. Oh, there we are. So there's the Field Museum. And I'm like, if I don't know where the Field Museum is, I can click on that. And I can see here that it is Chicago. Let's bring Chicago in. And then someone had asked, what do the blue numbers represent? So are you talking about the numbers here? Yes. So that's normally, um, yeah, unfortunately, the, the numbers here are not going to be that useful to you, except that it says it's four nodes that show up, which is kind of interesting, right? So you can actually see that instead of one answer, it has 
four answers. And it's not going to expand the four answers for you until you click on the node, right? So you can see that it was significant event. And it says Great Chicago Fire, World's Columbia's Columbian Exposition, Fort Dearborn, Century Progress. So that's kind of cool. So the numbers there will show you there's multiple things that come back. But if you click on it, I will show you what those things are. It's kind of neat, right? Uh, so let's see if I click on this one. What is this one? This is uh, shares border with, oh, that's kind of interesting. So someone had gone through the, yes. So someone has gone through the pain of saying Chicago shares a border with Skokie, uh, Park Ridge, Evanston, all that stuff, which is kind of interesting. So, you know, you can start to see that you start with Sue the Dinosaur, you look at the museum, you start to learn more about Chicago and you can start moving, moving out. So it's kind of like what I'm sure everyone has done before is you've started a Wikipedia article and oops, 30 minutes later, you accidentally learn 10 new things. And this is just like the graph version of the wiki wormhole, as we call it. Like you start to go in and start to learn these things and like, oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize that we modeled all this information of Chicago having all this uh, interesting stuff here. And if I want to know more about the World's Columbian Exposition, I can do that and expand that. Commemorates the quadrennial, and we can start to move out from this. So really cool things you can do with this tool. And now you have a general purpose tool with knowledgegrapher.toolforge.org. And I recommend Andrew. you try that. We had a quick question on your previous screen. If someone was asking Susan White, what do the blue numbers represent? Oh yeah, so I, I marched through that, but I'll show you again. So if you go through, uh, if you go through clicking on these things, anything with a number shows you that there's actually three instance of statements. If you click on that, it'll expand those three. So you can see here that it's kind of interesting. That's kind of like multiple things that Sue the dinosaur is here, Tyrannosaurus rex, it's a skeleton, it's a fossil find. So it's kind of like multiple multiple instances of things there. And if you want to find out more about T-Rex, you can do that. Uh, if you want to find out more about skeletons, you can do that. And anytime you, you click on the number, it's going to expand that to show you more information. Thank yep. you. Yeah, so th that's just really fun to do this and uh, try different things there. and. I will warn you that it kind of fails silently if you don't enter in something that matches, right? So if you put in two very um, unrelated things, it's just going to bring back blank. So you need to kind of know something, uh, something very solid, like Leonardo, right? If they say Leonardo da Vinci and the last, oh, actually, Last Supper is by Mona Lisa is probably better. There's many Last Suppers by many artists, so. Only one really famous Mona Lisa. I hope this comes back with that connection. Yes, we can start to explore out from there and start expanding those nodes. Okay, so we I, I've seen folks put in like 10, 20, 30 things and create really cool things. Uh, I will show you one last thing if you want to play with this. We're not going to have time here. If you go to Filmmaker, I have a special mode where you can put in one filmmaker and it'll show you all the films and all the actors of that person. This is really cool. So if I click click on Catherine Bigelow, anyone here, the film historian, this is really fun to do. I put in Catherine Bigelow and look at that. It's going to show you all the films she's worked on, whether it's a producer, screenwriter, director, and then all the actors she's worked with as a result of that. So you can start to see you know, the favorite actors that have worked with her in different films, um, which is kind of fun. And then sometimes you have these little isolated islands that have nothing to do with anything else, like TV series episodes. So. There's a lot of cool insights you can have by using tools like these graphing tools. And then if you're interested here, you can also go to creator mode and click on artists. So for example, Mary Cassatt, which is huge. I hope it doesn't blow up my computer here. And just to give you a warning that you'll get more meaningful results here for artists that have works before 1925. Does anyone know why 1925 is important? I think most people here probably know why 1925 is important. But you'll see, you know, all these paintings of hers and then what they depict show up here. Yes, Liz is correct. Copyright, right? So post nineteen twenty five or pre nineteen twenty five, generally, um, you can uh, start to see a lot more public domain works. And then um, anything post nineteen twenty five, you're not going to get a lot. So modern art, not a lot of images on Wikidata. All right. So you now have the tool in your hand that even most Wikipedia editors and most Wikidata editors don't know about. So you have a secret power that those folks don't know about with knowledgegrapher.toolforge.org. Okay, so Wikidata has more than 90 million items. Simple searches take less than a second, which is pretty amazing. 
and complex queries are supported by a language called Sparkle. All right, so let me just show you an example of how this works. It's actually pretty simple how this works. If I want to find all instances of bicameral legislatures, remember we had that triple before? All we need to do is specify to the query engine of Wikidata, we put in question mark legislature, and then we put in P31 and Q189445. The WDT tells Wikidata we're looking at this you know, property. And then WD call, it means we're looking for a Wikidata item called Q189445. And if we put question mark legislature in the front, it's just gonna match the last two against anything it can find for that first variable. That's it. So you basically just specify a pattern and then it'll find all the stuff that matches that pattern. So here's an example of what that brings up. You can start to see here that when you run a query, and I'll show you a, a query in a second, about 48 results in less than one second. Okay, so that is pretty amazing if you think about it. So I did this query like a year or two ago, there's 52 million items. Now there's 90 million items. It still comes back in less than two seconds, I think it is. That's pretty amazing. You're searching 90 million records from a database that's constantly changing and you're getting results in a second or so. So you can start to see that there are bicameral legislatures, not just in the US, but Kenya, India, Canada, and then you can graph these and do interesting things with that information. Okay, so then the last thing I'll show you kind of here as part of a Wikidata item are identifiers. So this is something that Liz had talked about before, like how do you point out to other databases and, and how do you follow that information? So at the bottom of any Wikidata entry are what we call identifiers. And this is sometimes I call the, the pot of gold at the end of a Wikidata item. These are really valuable to say, hey, we have this queue number for this artist. Here's who it is in that database. And here's that exact match in Library of Congress and Getty and Europeana and Tate and Met. And that's super valuable because we don't actually have anywhere that does that in an authoritative way or in a comprehensive way. And Wikidata, if for no other reason, is getting very popular just for that function of resolving um, these authority control records or identifiers to other places. All right, so here's some examples of what these P numbers look like or these properties or the um, uh, identifiers as we call them. Uh, these are just some examples that we use in the Smithsonian uh, world here. Cooper Hewitt has a person ID. Sam or American Art Museum has a person or institution ID. Um, there's a volcano ID, which is kind of cool. There's an identifier for volcanoes. So Smithsonian is not just museums, scientific uh, applications. So there's a lot of identifiers here for different folks. So we had another question. Oh, or if you're having a day that needs something calming, update <laughs> LCAF and ULAN IDs and Wikidata. It is very relaxing. It's actually really fun. Uh, there are some games that we have in our Wikidata world that allow you to just sit back and hit one, two, three buttons just to match things with Wikidata, which is really cool. All right, so let's go through the querying part of Wikidata and then we'll go to some examples. So querying, so this is what the query looks like in Wikidata very quickly. And the basic search is very simple in Wikidata. Uh, you can actually choose from a bunch of examples there. We're gonna go through that in a second. And this is what that query language looks like. Don't be scared off by the all caps or the service wiki base. Pretty much what you see in the middle there on line three, item WTP31 Q146, which is a cat. That's the main thing. The only thing you really changed in any query is to say, I'm looking for all cats in Wikidata. So let's do that all together. Uh, so let's go and try query.wikidata.org. And I could give you a direct link to the cat query, but I want you to learn how to do it on your own. So you quick go to query.wikidata.org and you should get this screen here. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so you can all see it. So hopefully everyone has that there. I will also paste a link into the chat so people can just click on that. So I'll give you a second to get there. Now, the only Big downside of this, it doesn't really give you much direction what to do. I recommend people just go to examples. Oh, let's see. Yes, we have, do we have cats on screen? Yes, we have cats on screen, awesome. So <laughs> Courtney has her cat on screen, that's great. So this is uh, gonna make your cat happy. So we actually have lots of cool queries. Show me all humans without children. Show me all, uh, show me all, uh, where is it? Countries that have site links on Ian Wiki. But we're going to go ahead and choose cats. So if you click on cats, you will see a very simple query where this is the content right there, right? 
if you click on the eye icon right there, it'll show you kind of a, a friendlier display of this right there. So it says, show me all instances of Housecat. Okay, and that's it. So you just brought up the query and go ahead and click on the blue play button right there. And you will see, hopefully, there we are, 149 cats come back in 180 milliseconds. So believe it or not, all 90 some million records were searched in 180 milliseconds. That's how fast these graph databases can be if you have a very pinpointed search like that. All right, so it's important to know that these are named famous cats. They are not tabby or main coon or anything. These are not breeds of cats. These are famous cats that rise to the level of having an individual entry. Some of these might look familiar. Some of these are YouTube stars. Some of these are presidential cats. Uh, that lived in the White House, like uh, Sox for Clinton. Um, some of these are just famous in their own right. They uh, had some famous uh, role in history and cats with fraudulent college degrees, yes. So one of the cool things about querying Wikidata is you can fight vandalism and things like that by just doing some basic checks, like um, make sure a cat hasn't lived more than 25 years or something like that. So sometimes you wanna do some sanity checking on things related to these types of records. But what's really cool about this is that you can change this very quickly. So if I go up here and I put my mouse on top of that, hopefully everyone's seeing that, it says instance of and Q146 is a house cat. But I can go in here and change this right here as well if I click on the I button, right? So the way I got here is I click on the I button. I can go in here and say horse, domesticated workhorse or domestic. So what would your, be your guess if I click on that? If I click on the blue button, would there be more or fewer horses hmm. and someone did the goats query is only eight goats yes unfortunately goats are not as well known in our human world but if you click on the blue button you'll notice that there are a lot more horses that come up eleven thousand more horse or eleven thousand some horses right and you're probably wondering what's going on well it kind of makes sense because these are all racehorses or mostly racehorses or show horses Right? So these are named famous horses versus named famous cats versus named famous goats. But this is your basic Wikidata query. And most of your queries are gonna be of this type. Show me all instances of paintings, of archeological sites, things like that. And that's your basic query. And once you get that down, it's actually quite simple to customize this going forward, right? So hopefully you folks have done that to do the cats query and gotten your basic information about cats and goats. Someone just did the goats. Okay, so you can go back to the slides and kind of play with this on your own. But this is really fun to try these different queries. The cool thing also is that if you have different kind of data types coming back in different columns, it'll do magic for you. It'll make graphs, maps, charts, all these different things. So let's do one more query before we di deep dive into some case studies here. So let's examine DC area museums. And I'm saying DC only because I'm sitting here in DC, but I'm gonna have you change this query to be whatever you want. So go ahead and click on this one, w.wiki slash 5vz. So let me see if I can copy this link. Ooh, no, that's not good. Let me go ahead and try going to uh, type that in correctly, w.wiki slash 5vz, like that. And if you click on that query, you notice what happens is that it will look for all museums within a hundred kilometer radius of the center of Washington, DC. Now, when it comes back, it's going to show you the Q number, right? The item, the label, right? You know what a label is now, American history. I mean, sorry, American Poetry Museum, Peterson House, Baltimore Museum of Industry. It's gonna show you also the, the geo coordinates as well. And this is where the magic happens because it has a geo coordinate if you go to the left-hand side, now the map option lights up. And believe it or not, if you just click on map, it's gonna do that. Because it said, oh, there's a geo coordinate, you probably want me to map, put on a map, and it just does it, which I find really cool, even to this day. Like I'm a programmer and I find this not that hard to do, but I much rather prefer it do it automatically for me. So look at that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and what you can do is go back to that list, like you go back here to the table, you can say, but I'd rather see a gallery of images. See, a lot of these had pictures. Can I just see a scrapbook of images? Absolutely. You go back here and say image grid. And there you are, there grid. And if you have collections in Wikidata, this is really cool. You can kind of see all your 
content in this kind of slideshow format, not slideshow, but a kind of a scrapbook format here. You'll also notice that if you go back to the table, we also have inception. So you can actually do a timeline of like when these museums were founded in DC, which is kind of cool. And then visits. If you do a visitor data, there is a, a field for visitor data. You can go in here and say, make a bubble chart. And look at that, that's pretty cool, right? So you can see that air and space and museum of natural history and DC are the most popular. And that is true. We know that for a fact. Um, but it's kind of neat uh, how many other things. Now, this is not a very useful title there. We can actually go in and look at National Gallery of Art. That's also very popular as well. Right, so that's pretty neat that we can take the same query and, and kind of hone in on any of these columns and come up with a display. And we could do timeline too, but it's not as pretty, but I'll just show you just to be complete. That's what your timeline looks like. So all those options are available to you um, when you return those columns in here. And that's why I think, you know, Wikidata as an adjunct to Wikipedia is so powerful because you don't need to wait for someone to make these graphs and charts. And believe it or not, that's what things are done. Uh, that's what things are done as right now in Wikipedia. They're hand drawn. They are handmade uh, mostly. And you need to wait for someone who's adept at uh, Adobe Illustrator or GIMP or any of these tools to make these graphs and charts. And here you can make them on your own with Wikidata, right? Okay, so what I want you to do is let's try modifying that query. I rarely make my own queries. I always copy someone else's query or based off something else. So if you go into your query and the right hand side here says edit sparkle right there, right? On the right hand side says edit sparkle. You click on edit sparkle and you will be presented with code here that you know, you're kind of scared of, but you can go ahead and click on the I button if you want right here, click on the I button and change Washington DC to whatever city you want. It doesn't even have to be city. It could be a, you know, some other uh, thing that has a coordinate location. So let's say I'm going to say um, the Space Needle work. Let's try this. Let's say hundred kilometers from the Space Needle. Let me hit that play button. Yes, it found 61 museums within hundred kilometers of the Space Needle. So I don't even have to specify a city. I can say a, a something that has geo coordinates. It's gonna find out those coordinates and do that. And then what I can do is go down here in the eyeball button and choose map. And look at that. There are all the museums, pretty much the Seattle area, 100 kilometers from the Space Needle. Pretty cool. So what I want you to do is go ahead and try that with either where you're sitting now or some interesting location. Um, you can even, if you're daring, go ahead and change the 100 to something else, right? So you can go in here and say, I don't, I don't want 100, I want a 500 kilometers. So you can go ahead and change 500 right there. And I can change it to, um, let's say, uh, let's say, Mount Everest Medical Base Camp Planet now. Let's say something else here. I can say Mount Fuji and hit play. And it should come back with something. I hope. But I'm, I have a wider radius, so it might take a longer time to look for that. Oh, that's actually a lot of stuff to come back. 1,600. So 500 kilometers is pretty big. So a lot of museums come back there. So go ahead and try that. So I would say just change the location there and try generating a map. I'm going to change this back to 100. And then make sure you can, after executing that query, see the results in a map or just pull down on the eyeball button and choose map right there. Okay, and there's my map for Mount Fuji. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and capture that, screenshot that, and I'm gonna go back to my Google doc that I gave you this morning and I'm just gonna paste it in there. So notice that I put in the one for Omaha earlier and I'm gonna say, Mount Fuji and pasted my little graphic. Oops, let me go back here and do it again. So go ahead and try that. Make it, make your map for your locale and try pasting it into the document there.
Oops, not sure why it's not making it in there now. I'll give you a few minutes to just make sure you can do that. So there is Space Needle, there is Mount Fuji. If you have any problems with that, let us know in the chat, see if there's if something went wrong. Yes, can you sh please show how to get from the query to the page with the graph? Oh, the page with a graph. Oh, okay, so I'm not sure if this one is gonna have it, but you can pull down this menu right here and you can get to uh, timeline, you can get to bubble chart. So it looks like we do have some data come back here. Oh, actually, this, look, this query has got multiple national art centers here, might be different divisions. Yep, great. So yeah, it's, it's going to light up different options depending on how many columns you have here. If you don't have geo coordinates, it won't light up the map option. But if you can, paste in some of your creations in here. Oh, nice. Someone did Los Angeles. That's great. Someone did. Sometimes it's hard to guess where these places are if you don't. That looks like Yale or New Haven. Yes, great. Gainesville, Florida. Nice. Okinawa, that's great. So if you don't know, if you if you know that there's museums missing, that's a great prop to go into Wikidata to try to enter it in geo coordinate data or to fix some of those entries in there. Okay, but that's a great uh, exercise to to try to go in and investigate your the glam organizations in in your area just to make sure they have something in Wikidata. Okay, so some examples like Chicago, Seattle, Houston, all have interesting results there. If you are interested in doing some of these queries, but you don't want to wrestle with the complexity of that query, we do have a simpler tool called VizQuery. And it's more like, you know, Mad Libs, like fill in the blanks uh, for searching. And there's whole tutorials on how to do the more advanced searches. And there's really cool things you can do, but uh, we're not going to get into that in this, um, in this presentation, but we're going to talk about some of the interesting case studies, I hope that you folks would be interested in. So one, that we want to hone in on is open access at the Met Museum. So um, why don't we take a quick stretch break while we make sure that Jeannie Choi is in the room as well. We are good about 30 minutes after our first stretch break. Let's do another stretch break. Um, and Jeannie hopefully has audio and video available because Jeannie really is the, the database master of the Met that I work with to do most of these projects. Jeannie, are you around? I'm ready. Oh, great. Hi, Jeannie. Why don't you introduce yourself to everyone Hi. real quick? Hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie Choi. Um, I'm the general manager of collection information at the Metropolitan Museum. And I've been working with Andrew for about two years now um, with Wikidata. And um, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And I think um, what Andrew's going to show you hopefully will pique your interest and in, will um, inspire you to add your institution's records to Wikidata. Excellent, thank you. And we'll definitely get uh, Jeannie to, to introduce some of these things uh, that we've been working on with you. Uh, if we wanted to kind of break down the, the three parts of kind of how we think about this, uh, some of you might recognize this as Nina Simon's uh, construction, which I really love of like, how do you engage the public with your organization? So whether it's contribution as kind of the first stage or collaboration, and then the elusive third step of co-creation. How do you get to this, this new area that you're making things that neither side have, heard, have thought of before? And I think we've kind of hit this all three stages now with the MET organization um, and the MET engagement with the community, which I think is really exciting. So number one is the contribution stage. As we mentioned before, 2017 was the release of the open access uh, materials. And uh, for anyone who wants to get into this, there is a, there are good case studies on how organizations are releasing their images and metadata under a CC0 license. That's the, that's the most useful to the, to the world and to the Wikimedia community. And uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, the Met, Smithsonian, a lot of folks have done this uh, with, with great success. And once we have that metadata and the images available to us, we can now bring those objects into Wikidata. So this is an example of what an ideal Wikidata item looks like from the Met, right? We have the labels, description, aliases, which we edited before. We hopefully have meaningful statements and claims, and then external identifiers that we want to point out to the Met content, right? So for example, the death of Socrates that we just looked at, we have the label, the description, and the alias. 
but we also want other stuff as well, like the inception, like when was it painted? Uh, what is it? Is it a painting? Is it a drawing? Um, what genre might it be? Uh, what's the material used? Uh, it's dimensions, height and width, the copyright status of this thing. Um, the inventory number within the organization where we can kind of link directly to the object pages or the APIs of that organization to get more information about it. So this is an example of, you know, kind of the ideal core statements that we want in Wikidata for a met object. And uh, hopefully if you folks are interested here, whether you're an art museum, historical society, or um, some other entity, there's some meaningful things that you can add to Wikidata based on your expertise and collections. It may not even be a holding. It may just be a database of women authors that we don't have in Wikidata. And that's super useful to have as just um, populating Wikidata and pointing to your, your data. And the kind of the core of everything that we do with the Met is a special Met object ID. As you mentioned before, this is a P number. So you have to propose this to the community and say, there's a good reason why we wanna create a new unique identifier for organization. And for most museums out there that have their database exposed to the public, whether it's a web, uh, a series of web pages or an API, it's not that hard to get a object ID uh, or identifier like this. And then we just have some extra special modeling that we do for the Met. Uh, we're very lucky that the Met has broken down kind of like an all-star set of artworks, which we call, you know, the highlights, and then it has the timeline of art history, which is like a bigger set, and then it has like objects on view, which is the greatest set. So we actually have a special designation for those things in Wikidata. So you can actually search all the highlight objects very quickly out of Wikidata or the timeline of art history objects in Wikidata. And Andrew, Jeannie, you've worked, with, you've worked on this too, go ahead. Andrew, yeah. we have a question from Brenda. Are there Wikidata yes. templates or style guides for facilitating creation of different types of common entries um, or help to uh, ensure consistency across museums and artworks, et cetera? That's a great question. It's, it gets back to that uh, comment we had before or the thing that we observed before that there's no rigid schema on Wikidata, which means that sometimes it's really hard to divine how to model a painting or a watercolor or something like that. So we do have kind of best practices documented in a wiki project on Wikidata called Visual Artworks. And you can go there or contact me, I can give you a pointer to that. Um, but most things in Wikidata, if there's enough critical mass, people will create what we call a wiki project and then try to lay out the schema that is agreed upon. Um, and then this is really getting geeky, but there's a new standard in semantic web called Shex, really weird, S-H-E-X, which is meant to really define schemas for things like this. Um, so that's kind of the next generation. For now, we do have tables where we try to label, uh, try to come up with the best practices for modeling, things like this. So paintings is pretty good, but other things like sculpture, not so good. Hopefully that answers that question, but it's a great question because when I said schemaless, but if it's schemaless, how do I add the next thing? That's a good question. It's not always easy to figure that out. Um, I won't go too far into this, but this is just showing that we do have tools to mass import content from your databases into data, into Wikidata and also to crosswalk this across. So we can say, you know, you call something altarpiece and we call it this. You call something this and we call it that. And then we can crosswalk and, and uh, cross-link those things. Um, and then we also have technical tools. So something most people don't know about is that Wikipedia is an encyclopedia anyone can edit. We actually have like a compute farm on the back end and most anyone can create an account, interestingly enough, and run code to help improve Wikipedia and Wikidata. So anyone who's out there has got a little bit of coding or a little bit of interest in that, you can create an account today on the back end of Wikipedia to do coding, which is really fascinating, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, we talked about the summary of um, representing the Met content in Wikidata, but some of the challenges here, I'm sure everyone's gonna run into are things like, well, sometimes the Met object ID is like a, a set of things. It's not a cup or a chalice, it's a tea set, or it's an altarpiece with five distinct pieces. And sometimes that's complex to model in Wikidata. Um, so those are kind of our weird edge cases we need to deal with sometimes. Um, Jeannie, you, you have a lot of experience with moving things into Wikidata from your database. Any words of advice or some insights from what it took to take TMS content to correlate it to Wikidata? Um... I would familiarize my, yourself with uh, Quick Statements, which is a tool to mass, do mass uploads. 
The challenge is mapping. So everything on Wikidata has to map to an existing item except for titles and numerical values. So all our object names have to be mapped. All our artists, a lot of our Wikidata items do not have artists because they do not yet exist on Wikidata. So I'm com right now compiling all our artists that need Wikidata items and I'm hoping the community <laughs> will help and create those items. So it can be very tedious, even something as simple as circuit dates. They have to be formatted, formatted just so you have to enter a qualifier. Very, very time consuming. Um, I haven't, we haven't done dimensions yet. Um, dimensions have just been added to our API, the numeric value. So hopefully that's going to be a little easier. Um, and then there are things, nuances that the schema doesn't accommodate, things like formally attributed to. There's no way to enter that right now in Wikidata. Things like dates, we have tapestries where we have date woven, we have sculpture where it's cast, we have negative photographs where we have a print date. There's no way to add that to Wikidata yet. Um, we have complex uh, weights and you know we have arms and armor, very complex dimensions. Again, the schema does not accommodate that. So I've been working with Andrew to try to propose new properties. So it's not as simple as uploading a spreadsheet the way we're used to with TMS. Um, it can be very tedious, but the more you familiarize yourself with these tools and the formatting it requires, it, it, it'll, it'll be a lot easier. But it is kind of fun. I, I like, I like, I've been enjoying, I enjoy doing it. We have two questions to follow up on that. The first one's from Liz, Liz mm -hmm. Neely. How does the Met handle record updates and get that new information into Wikidata and Wikidata? And I know you sort of touched on that. The second one from Brenda is, how did you deal with duplicates, existing records about objects already in your collection? So duplicates, um, I'll just answer the duplicates question. Usually when, um, because our object ID is already a property in Wikidata, in the past when I've tried to add it, I get an error. It won't let me add something that has an existing Met ID. So that's good. So we don't have, I don't think we have any duplicates unless object IDs have changed. Um, updates is sort of another holy grail that I hope to work with the community on <laughs> because we do have an API. So it could be possible for you know something to be built to call our API to get updates. Um, but right now we don't have an automated way to keep our data updated. Yeah, that's a great point from uh, Jeannie. I think the, the our long-term goal is to come up with a better uh, kind of uh, round trip synchronization it has helped a lot. And we'll talk about it in a few slides that uh, Jeannie now holds in the TMS database, Wikidata identifiers for the artwork, for depiction information and the artist. And we did not have that two years ago when we started, it was kind of a one way of like Wikidata ingesting Met content. But now that we, the TMS on the Met side holds the Wikidata ID, it's really great to have synchronization that way. And we can solidify both sides much better that way. So I think we are, we have a bot that kind of tries to do that on a periodic basis. Um, we can probably do 80 to 90% of the synchronization easily, but then we have a lot of weird edge cases um, where we need to kind of come up with some better solutions for that. Uh, some other questions, are people thinking about a crosswalk between linked art target model and Wikidata? So there's standardization. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. We, we are definitely looking into things like that as well. Yep. Um, okay, collaboration. Uh, so as we mentioned before, you know, finding new stories in things like the knowledge graph are really uh, great uh, in terms of opportunities. And we even have already discovered, you know, insights into things because Wikidata is like a fashion database and an arts database and a literature database and a, and a uh, database of biographies. It is allowing us to see connections we never really appreciated before. And then co-creation. So this is an example. We talked about it briefly last year at MCN uh, that where we used the Met Museum's art keywords, artwork keywords for machine learning. And then we trained a machine learning system with the, you know, all the tags that uh, the Met had added for their artworks. And then we said, well, what happens if we feed the machine learning system a new painting it had never seen before and see if it could predict what was in that painting and we, were, we made the job a lot easier because we said paintings, not 3D artworks, 2D artworks only, um, probably paintings before 1925 because they're public domain. Um, and it, you know, it's a much narrower domain than, than trying to match anything in the world. And we actually got some very nice results from this. So um, here's an example of what Liz was talking about before. Like, can I just kind of relax and help 
Wikidata out? Yes, you can. So we actually turned this into a game where the recommendation from the AI you know, was of uncertain quality. So we fed it into the game and the game basically displays this to the user. And then the user says, um, the, the, the game asks the user, um, does this painting depict a tree? Because our AI thinks it depicts a tree. And all you need to do to be a useful contributor is to click on depicts a tree, does not depict a tree, or you skip it if you're unsure. That's it. You just have three buttons uh, on your keyboard that, that does this. Or you can tap on your screen. I've done this waiting in line at McDonald's before. You know, play this game. And it's great because you can help improve the AI and add content. So here's an example of what we had at the in the lobby of the uh, the Great Hall at the Met. We had people come up who never ever edited Wikipedia, don't know what Wikidata is, and just had them play this game. And they're meaningfully adding statements to Wikidata simply by clicking on the green button or the blue button. And we actually had like 7,000 some judgments, resulting in about 5,000 edits from our first test. And it did really well on things like tree, boat, flower, horse, soldier, house. So kind of landscape painting features, it did really well, but it did not do good on gender determination. Cats and dogs, strangely enough, it didn't do that well on cats and dogs. Um, I guess they can have all different positions and things like that. And you know, we, we've, we kind of felt like, oh, we really failed on gender determination. But you know what's, what, what's interesting? Google announced last year, it was going to quit doing gender determination on image recognition. Because it said, uncontextualized, it does not make sense to take the pixels of an image and determine whether it's a male or female. It just doesn't make sense. And I think that's the right decision. And it's kind of something that everyone who deals in this space knows is the right move, is to not try to predict with a 90% certainty, that's a boy, that's a girl, that's a woman, that's a man. It just doesn't make sense, right? Andrew, um, we yes. have a question about someone wondering where this game is. I think people would like uh, to play. Yes, well, the funny thing is it was so successful, we exhausted the the bucket of, of AI recommendations. We need to we need to fire it up again to feed more artworks into it. So we, we processed uh, all the paintings we had, I think from Sam, American Art Museum, from uh, Reich's Museum and some other uh, Cleveland Museum of Art. So we need to feed more in. So contact me and we can maybe think of more things to put in there. Uh, maybe Jeannie and I can uh, find some bandwidth to try to get more artworks to be processed by the AI. Because it's, it's, it's quite interesting. But the funny thing is our community is so prolific, they burn through the game very fast. Um, so we need more candidates in there. That's right. Uh, so yeah, there's a great comment in the chat. Like what is gender, gender is overdetermined anyway. It's like, yeah, it's just a foolish exercise to try to do that. Um, okay, so we have contribution, collaboration, co-creation as kind of these three slices. And I think we're meaningfully doing it in not just the open access slice, the collaboration to create new story slice, but also in using AI and machine learning to, to come up with new recommendations we not even thought of before to create new tools. So I thought I'd show you just some of the, the dashboards and the stats that we have, and you can click on these links and go to them yourself. We actually have little dashboards that track how complete are the items in the Wikidata uh, from the Met. And these are gonna get better as, as uh, Jeannie said, now that they're structuring dimensions and keeping the, the uh, artist IDs as not just strings, but things, we can start to do better in these areas of completing the properties for all these things in the Wikidata. You could also go through and just look at the whole inventory, every single object we have in Wikidata um, in a chart like this from the Met. And then we also have things like, you know, what are the most popular artworks that are being uh, described by uh, Wikipedia and Wikidata right now? These are the ones that rank near the top. And then we also have some stats that we often run on what are the most popular images that, and popular artists that are in the Met. And then I thought, uh, Jeannie, you could talk about this. This is really cool. This is kind of the next step that we're doing where um, now that the Met is ingesting and holding pointers to Wikidata specifically, there are kind of neat things that we can do here. Yeah, so during the past year, I um, imported all the Wikidata items, QIDs for our objects. We have about 22,000 objects that have Wikidata items. So I store that in TMS. I've also mapped our artists to Wikidata items. Um, and I use that um, because we imported all the ULAN IDs for our artists that matched to ULAN. I used, did that last year with OpenRefine. Um, I'm, I pulled, I queried all the names with ULAN IDs and Wikidata and then matched them to our existing ULAN ID. So in one shot, I got about 12,000 names um, that now have Wikidata items. And then for our keyword tags, um, I, we have about 1,100 subject keywords. I map those to these data items, store that in TMS. 
And, and those have all been added to our API, which Andrew has, is showing right now. So we include the Wikidata URL, the AAP URL um, to the names, the objects, and our keyword tags. So it's um, hopefully people using our API can now use these links and then you know extend their queries to these other data sources. Yeah, this is great. It's just to see all this, uh, all these connections now in a way that uh, we did not see just two, three years ago is really inspiring. And there's all these neat things that we can do for making sure data is synced correctly and also connecting to other databases um, in ways that, uh, that we have never seen before if we didn't have these you know, hyper precise Q numbers that are being held on the Met side. Um, so this is uh, available, I think what is it, Gene, like about two months now you've been feeding this via the API has been available? Um, yeah, so over the summer we added the Wikidata and AP URLs to the API. Great. Yeah, so you can hit the API with that URL there. It's also on GitHub. There's a whole dump of the uh, Wiki, I'm sorry, the Met database in a CSV file. So you can download all 600,000 rows of their TMS database and do wonderful things. And that's kind of how we did the uh, the AI project is uh, going through all that uh, all that content there. And, and so I just take a look say, at that, and we oh, actually. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say quickly that we're we're trying to be strategic in how we decide what to add to Wikidata. So as Andrew showed in the chart, we started with our printed guidebooks, which are sort of like the top highlights. Then we have our website highlights, which is about five thousand objects, and then our timeline objects, which is about eight thousand. We're working on objects on view. I've also added, I've tried to add records where I think there are gaps on in the Wikipedia ecosystem, as Andrew mentioned at the very beginning, like works by women. I added all our works by female artists. I added all our works by black artists. I added um, a huge bunch of our costume records because there's very little fashion in Wikipedia, but it's very, very popular. We've had two editors de dedicated to fashion and they've been very well attended and very well received. So I'm also trying to fill in the gaps where I know they exist in the Wiki ecosystem at large. So we are yeah. trying to try to be strategic. We don't, it's not like we're gonna recreate our online collection on Wikidata, that is not the point. We're not gonna have all our spoons and all our shoes, you know, but we do wanna contribute records where we think that people should have access to, that should get better exposure and that will contribute to um, open knowledge. Deborah House has a question that follows up on that. Thinking about the MC mm -hmm. night session on your data are racist. Are there things that we can do in the audience to collectively improve these amazing wiki platforms to be more inclusive? Yeah, that's a great question. We are trying to do a lot in this area, um, not just racist, but sexist. Um, so I think Wikidata is really useful in that it tries to tear down that super high bar that we had in Wikipedia, because that super high bar meant that we only had 15% of all biographies in Wikipedia were about women. Right now, we've improved it quite a bit to like 18 and a half percent. That's a lot relative, but it's still far short of what we'd like to see. But that's still a net gain of 200,000 women biographies over the last five years. That's really great. But we still have a long way to go. Wikidata is, is, gives us the opportunity to do a little bit better in that because the notability bar is not that high. We can be more inclusive there. But we have run into a lot of issues as well, but it's the same issues that you see all over the place, right? Like how do we model ethnicity correctly or properly in Wikidata to find all African-American artists? You know, that's, that's sticky. Um, and then even just the gender field that we have is really messy and, and cringeworthy. So it's like, okay, 85% of the time, but cringeworthy another five or 10% of the time. Uh, so yes, uh, we need expertise from the GLAM community to help in this area as well. So I think the decolonizing uh, museum side is really great too, to help inform some of the stuff that we're doing in Wikidata. Um, and also the, uh, the issues with ethnicity and modeling that. We, we need more help in that area, certainly. Um, oh. I don't know if we have time for Santa Ana's wooden leg, but I thought I'd just mention this. We don't, we don't have time to do it, but I'll just point it out. 
This is interesting that there probably is not enough information about Santa Ana's wooden leg, General Santa Ana, to have a Wikipedia article, but it certainly deserves a Wiki, Wikidata entry. And believe it or not, there is no Wikidata entry for Santa Ana's wooden leg. Um, in fact, there's not a Wikidata article about the museum that holds Santa Ana's wooden leg. And you might know this is kind of a funny story in that this was, I think, what was it, taken by some regiment of of uh, soldiers that brought it back to Illinois and it's now sitting at the Illinois State Military Museum, fairly small museum, that this is by far the most famous artifact they have. I cannot find an open source or open access picture of Santa Ana's wooden leg. It's not in commons. There's no wiki data item for the leg. There's no wiki data item for the Illinois State Military Museum as we speak. Um, so I thought we had time, we could do this together, but I think we're running a little bit out of time, but I wanna leave time for questions. Um, but this remains an exercise for the reader if you want to try this, or I might just do it later this week. But I thought this was really interesting because um, you know Texas has been trying to get this leg from Illinois for the longest time because it's got a lot more relevance to Texas history than Illinois history. But the uh, but the people in Illinois are like, nope, we're keeping this leg, and it's been kind of a funny story. So just trying to model this in Wikidata would have been quite interesting. Uh, so just to sum up, and I'd love to have some time for questions. Wikidata is still an early work in progress, even though it's now like what coming on years old. Um, many areas are quite bare. So there's still a lot of major issues with it as we just talked about before with uh, modeling, ethnicity, gender, things like that. Um, so what we'd like to do is to see more use of Wikidata content. And you're starting to see this in Wikipedia already. Believe it or not, there has been some pushback in incorporating Wikidata content in Wikipedia editions. So the information boxes you see on the right-hand side of Wikipedia articles are starting to use Wikidata a lot more. But interestingly enough, English Wikipedia has been pushing back on this because they're like, ah, we don't need this Wikidata project. We can do it all on our own. And it's these smaller languages that are embracing Wikidata, which is probably looking back on it, not surprising, but it's quite interesting to see that the largest entrenched Wikipedia editions are the most resistant to using Wikidata. So if you're to summarize Wikidata, I sometimes call it internet duct tape, but in the most affectionate way, not that it's a hack, but it's like the thing that ties things together. Um, it is becoming a hub for a lot of folks, especially if you're an archivist. There's a lot more activity now with, with pointing Wikidata to the archives of like Eisenhower or these famous uh, authors or, or academic libraries. So it's quite interesting to see how um, that property is now being used a lot more. Um, so join us in doing a lot more of these experiments. Contact myself or other folks at the, um, I'm gonna skip this real quick, at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, there is this site here that shows kind of the workflow for data and media partnerships. So if you're interested in trying your, your hand at contributing to Wikipedia and Wikidata, this is kind of a nice workflow for trying some of this. And um, there's the link right there on, on the slide 115. Wow, 115 slides in this deck. And you can go and click on there or contact me and I can point you in the right direction. We also have the Wikidata in one page. And then in terms of tangible next steps, I mentioned that Fiona Romeo is now a full-time senior program manager for Glam and Culture at the Wikimedia Foundation. So she's no stranger to MCN. So that's great. You can contact her or myself. Um, I'm not with the Wikimedia Foundation, but we tend to do community things and official things uh, in different ways. Um, there's also a project called Finding Glams that tries to document every single library archive museum around the world. So feel free to get involved with that. We also have a Wikimedians in Residence Exchange Network. So if you're interested in a Wikimedian residence or some kind of a part-time person even on a volunteer basis to help with some of the stuff with your organization, feel free to contact me. I can put you in touch with them. Um, there's also the Open Glam movement. So it's a lot of stuff being done with Open Glam and Creative Commons. They just had a hackathon a few months ago. And then also there's a great project called Wiki Women in Red. And this is associated with the Smithsonian's new American Women's History Initiative as well. Um, trying to address the gender gap problem and try to get more and more uh, biographies of women in Wikipedia. And it's really moved the needle quite effectively, but we still have a lot to go here. So these are just some very simple ways to get involved uh, or just contact me and I can put you, point you in the right direction. So we do have at least five minutes for questions or discussion on any of these things. Um, it's a lot to digest, I know, but I thought it was important to kind of give you a foundation for Wikidata and give you some examples on what might inspire you. So any questions, you can either type it directly in the chat or you can um, get recognized by audio and video. Love to chat with you. Uh, 
Oh, there is a MCN 2020 Wikidata channel. Oh, that's great. I've got to go join that. Not yet, oh, but it will be in about. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be soon. And I'm happy to join that. Fantastic. And I know we had a couple people who were very interested in seeing that demo, which I know we don't have time for, but they can reach out to you there on the Slack, on the Slack Santa, channel. For Santa Ana's leg? For Santa Ana's leg or just uh, any questions they have on how to get involved that they might not have caught during this. Yeah, yeah. Reach out to me. There's my email and my my handle on almost every social media platform. Um, thanks, Danielle. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, feel free to let me know. Too fast, too slow, more of this, less of that. Uh, we've done a brief Wikidata two years ago, Wikidata tutorial, but this goes further in terms of talking about real collections, data, things like that. Thanks, Allegra and Emily. And I might do the Santa Ana's leg and post the results in the Slack channel. Oh, I forgot to mention, we do have a Facebook group. So if anyone's a Facebooker, the Facebook group is fairly active and friendly. So there is a wikidata.glam group on Facebook as well. Do you have the link that you could share in the chat for that? For Facebook? Yeah, I can do that. Oops, I need to go to public here. All right, we have one quick question with our three minutes from Brenda. Uh, she is focused on dupes and wants to know, are there any ways to consolidate existing dupes within Wikidata? Yes, there absolutely is. Um, one, things you, one of the things that we, we have several tools that do duplication or merging. So uh, we do have what we call maintenance queries that try to find duplicates. And then if you're sure it's a duplicate, you can actually go in here and choose the um, merge option here. So you can actually take an option. I'm not going to merge Getty with something else. Well, you can actually take two Wikidata items and merge them. And then one will be redirected to the other one. And uh, yeah, that's the, the, the cleanest way that we have to do merges. But we, you need to make sure they are, in fact, exactly the same. Um, sometimes they're not. I mean, they're sometimes very, very close, but they should be distinct. And that's oftentimes uh, a point of debate. We actually do have a whole section for proposing merges sometimes if they're complex. Oh, another thing that I can point out while we're waiting here is if you are interested, just go to Wikidata's project chat. So it's this button, the third one down. And this is also another great way to get started is just read the chat that's here. Anyone can post a question or ask a, ask a, make a request here. And it's pretty friendly here. It's English mostly. So you can go in there and uh, go to project chat on Wikidata and start conversing with folks. All right. Well, I'm going to say thank you to everyone, especially to Andrew for this amazing presentation. We will have this will be recorded. And if you were at the conference, you will have access to this recording as soon as we release it. We promise to email and message when it is ready. So you can ask, but it won't make it go faster. Thank you again so much, Andrew. And we will see you on Slack. Great. Thanks, everyone. See you on Slack.